All right, we're back. It's uh, top of the hour. And our conversation for this uh, next segment is going to be with Susan Furman, who is the president of Teachers College at Columbia University. Susan, well, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And just to, again, frame this, because we'll have individual segments available uh, archived, we are at the ASU GSV Innovation Summit in San Diego. We're on the Shindig platform. This is a collaborative venture with, with, that includes eSchool Media. And a reminder to our audience, if you have questions for Susan as we go through our conversation, you can text them in, you can raise your hand. Those of you who have video cameras, we may be actually able to bring you in as well live. So Susan, let me just let you frame this conversation a little bit. Tell us a little bit about Teachers College. You know, it, 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 as a civilian, in, 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 teacher training, but that's actually not a large part of what Teachers College does anymore. It's really no. the research and a lot of other stuff. It's a lovely historic name, yeah. and we do prepare 700 teachers in mm -hmm. any given year, but we also prepare more than that number of an assorted uh, set of professions, uh, psychologists, administrators, counselors, uh, organizational psychologists, and um, uh, health professionals, and uh, also we are uh, a large research institution, so we also prepare many analysts, researchers, and scholars. Mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to a, a former Columbia prof, Daniel Moy Patrick Moynihan. Mm -hmm. um, there's a clip that I found going through archives some years ago. And Moynihan was part of a study group at Columbia and Harvard in the wake of the historic Coleman Report in 1965. Inequality. Yeah, inequality in American education. Right. And the, one of the, in a congressional testimony, 1971, Moynihan was surprisingly candid. I mean, you know, the assumption was in the wake of inequality in education, the report will pour money into K-12 education and things will get better. Uh -huh. And even then, I'm reading from this quote, um, things in education are far more complicated than we thought. The rather simple input-output relationships which, and naive, naively no doubt, but honestly we assume to obtain an education simply upon examination, don't hold up. So placed in the context of the times, it was the Coleman Report, and currently a lot of the research in organizations with system thinking, it's got to be linear, inputs, throughputs, outputs. Um, there's still a lot to be found in, of wisdom and candor in, in Moynihan's statement that applies today. Why is it so hard? And you know, we have a lot of research. There's a lot of research that comes out of yeah. TC that comes out a lot of other places about what can be best practices, about impact in both K-12 and higher ed professional practice. And yet, we still struggle with a lot of right. it's complicated. Well, let me take the money part of it first right. and say that we know that resources count, and right. we know that a major challenge we face is inequality in the distribution of resources. Right. But it's also very true that the allocation of resources is critical. And those decisions are made in mm -hmm. this country in the most decentralized fashion of any nation in the world. Right. You know, we have uh, 15,000 school districts, you know, almost 100,000 mm -hmm. schools, 50 states, et cetera. And when those decisions are so uh, devolved to decision makers that are so dispersed, there's very uneven good use of resources and very uneven adoption of things that may be supported by evidence or may be seen as best practice. And that's why it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. There's a large conversation here about innovation and evidence at, at this conference. You know, these are It's a tech culture very much driven by evidence, by innovation. Um, and yet I think that, that many of us who work in education or who watch education still have a feeling that at least my work is in higher ed, I can't really speak for K-12, there's still a lot of what happens in terms of planning and decision-making and policy at the institutional level, let alone public policy, is still driven by epiphany and opinion as opposed to evidence. Is that a fair statement? It is. There's uh, mm -hmm. research I participated in some 20 years ago that shows that teachers yeah. uh, very often value colleagues' opinions and mm -hmm. word of mouth over other sources and that research or um, particularly scholarly articles, are way down on the list. Um, certainly policy analysts working in government uh, use research, but I think there are big gaps on each side. We, uh, in the research community, don't synthesize. We don't present the aggregation of the evidence, the weight of the evidence. We don't replicate. Yeah. So you have one-off studies, and we don't know if they work in other settings. On the other hand, um, we have a lot of impatient people with very short terms in office mm -hmm. who won't give things the time to imp get implemented that that research says we need to show if they really work. 
I'm thinking in higher ed, at least, surveys that I ran a couple of years ago, both presidents and provosts, about a thousand of each, asking, does your institution do a good job of using data for decision making? Barely half said that they thought their institutions did a very good job, even when there might be data there. And when we know there's even more data now than there yeah. might have been three or four years ago, um, I want to suggest that it would seem that not that higher ed is hostile to data, but at least the you know, sort of interesting and counterintuitive that is a place that produces research about how we operate, we still don't take a lot of it to bear for ourselves, kind of the position heal thyself kind of uh, aspect of it. Is that fair? Well, well um, it, 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 as in elementary and secondary, yeah. as I described it, higher ed is also decentralized right. decision making because there are professors who are <laughs> making decisions about what happens in their own classrooms, mm -hmm. and uh, institutions may be collecting a lot of data yeah. about graduates and their success and the like that are actually not getting to the professors. We just went through a middle states accreditation yeah. which required us to set learning outcomes right. at each program level, and with 18 programs across the school, we did enhanced alumni surveys and are using that data to redesign our programs. And then when it actually is, when the data are structured in a way that the professors want, need, and when it comes back to them in a useful fashion, they are using it to redesign their programs, to create extra practica, more practical experiences needed, to restructure uh, course sequences. Those kinds of changes are going on as a result of the alumni surveys. What about the work that goes on in ed schools communicated to the larger population? Is it a matter of a decoder ring? We don't do a good job of conveying this in a way that whether it's folks in the state legislature or uh, in other audiences you know, on so the street? It's, it's um, that there are over 1,200 education schools and they vary quite a bit. Some are purely teacher preparation and then you know, at the other extreme you find a very large and old institution like ours which is you know, uh, teacher preparation and um, many more things. Uh, so it's very hard to generalize and we haven't had uh, a, an accepted, um, widely used curriculum in teacher education because there's no accepted, widely used curriculum in K-12 in this country, the decentralization again. So we're unlike other countries in that respect. And if we could come to better agreement about the core components of teacher preparation, I think we'd be all be much better off. I want to address one of the questions we're getting from the audience. Uh, TC, you mentioned that teacher preparation is not its primary activity in terms of the student population, but you do a lot, of, a lot of it. You also do a lot of preparation of professionals in education. How is teacher preparation changing, or how does it need to change? So, uh, in many ways, teacher preparation mm -hmm. is changing. We're very proud that we have extensive clinical work and you know concentration yeah. on actual practice. Uh, and we're very proud that we make a special effort to integrate coursework with clinical work, and it's not two separate things. So knowledge and theory are truly integrated. But there are many changes that using technology in classrooms is new. Um, I think the learning sciences are in a time of explosion, and uh, prospective teachers need to know what we're all collectively learning about how students learn, and they need to incorporate that into their pedagogy. Um, what we're doing at Teachers College is to focus for the moment on um, teacher educators who are very often in position purely by happenstance. They got a, a doctorate degree in their subject and they never learned to teach adults, they never learned to supervise practice, they never learned to assess instruction, and those are things we're now deliberately trying to uh, teach prof uh, pr prospective teacher educators. What about innovation? in terms of fostering a culture of continuous quality improvement in education, both K-12 okay. and higher ed. I'm glad you defined innovation because uh, when it's used alone, mm -hmm. <laughs> it implies newness for newness, is, right. for newness sake. So it, at TC we talk about strategic innovation. But uh, yeah, continuous quality improvement um, in terms of constantly reassessing where you're going and and making it better is something that we try to do. The alumni surveys are an, an example, but we're uh, always using benchmark data and we're always trying to find out how employers are viewing our graduates. If I may, that, you're you're talking that. about TC, I'm thinking about the larger context in terms okay. of schools trying to, to uh, enculturating 
the context and, and, and oh, sure. the commitment to, to continuous quality improvement. It, yeah, well, what, you have to ask yourself what mm -hmm. are the incentives. Right now, the incentives have been to get uh, uh, as as good grades as you can on relatively narrow and unimaginative standardized tests. So why would there be people interested in continuous quality improvement in a larger sense and a more unimaginative and sophisticated sense? So we have to look carefully at the incentives that policy provides. Yeah. But, um, I want to come back to the policy issues. You know, let's focus on K-12. We've got 50 sure. states. They all do different things. We see this, you know, whether you want to use the metaphor of a bungee cord or a pendulum, we go through fashionable yeah. moments. Uh, we're now 30 years past nation at risk. It's an interesting, and we're, we're 10 years past the Spellings Commission, which was higher ed. And we have, there's a history almost each decade. There's a major national report about something related to education. We have a big kerfluffle. We yeah. pay a lot of attention to it. And then the question eight, 10 years later is, what's changed? And, uh, do these things really yeah. make a difference? Well, I'm not sure we're so different from other fields. I yeah. mean, as a woman trying to decide when, how often to have mammograms, I certainly can't look to consistent guidance from the medical community. Right. Um, I think if you look at particular reforms over the history of the last 70 years, yeah. there was a lot of progress in the wake of school desegregation. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of progress in the wake of school finance reform. Sure, there was slippage back, and the uh, early 21st century has not been a particularly productive one for K-12 education. Um, but uh, there has been improvement, there has been a closing of the achievement gap, and there are some states that are equal to top countries in any of the international assessments. So yeah. it's not that everything is terrible and we need to change everything. We know some things work and we need to design policy environments that support those things. We need to figure out how to scale them up wisely and we need to give people support. That's what's been missing. Mm -hmm. We have not attended to whether districts can help schools or whether states can help districts. We've actually cut the shreds out of those budgets. We certainly have not attended to the importance of professional development and making sure it's focused on the student curriculum. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to improve the policy levers that we use. I want to close with a question about data. You know, so there's been this ongoing conversation at the state and federal level about data metrics for success, effectiveness, and yet there is a long history of education, in education, of data being used as a weapon as opposed to a resource. You, know, uh, you alluded to it a moment ago when I asked about these commission reports. You said, well, things are getting better, but, the, but sometimes these things continue to highlight what we're not doing as well as we should. What's it going to take to change the culture of data in, higher edu in, in education, both K-12 and higher ed, from one of a weapon to one of a resource? Of not what, I think there's, of course, mixed use. And I yeah. wouldn't say, again, I don't think we're the only sector mm -hmm. where that happens. Uh, uh, physicians would now tell you that data is being used to constrain their practice. Yeah. To, to point out a, a particular protocol that the data show works where they're dealing with an individual patient. So uh, it's not dissimilar. Um, I think there is uh, a realization that um, there are better methods of analyzing data today and that uh, better uh, ways of getting um, data on all aspects, not just narrowly defined outcomes, but many other long-term outcomes, like success after college and, and in life. Mm -hmm. And um, so we just have to keep working at pointing out the usefulness of it. Great. All right. Susan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, we're going to be right back. I believe our next up is Ted Mitchell, the Undersecretary of Education. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you.